Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As every upstanding citizen, I asked ChatGPT to write a speech for me, and now you will listen to what ChatGPT had to say. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow enthusiasts of economic thought, welcome to the grand celebration of intellectual brilliance and free market principles. <laughs> In church, they told me Adam was the first man. In school, they told me Adam was the first economist. Tonight, we gather under the sparkling lights to commemorate a true giant of economic theory, the legendary Adam Smith, on the occasion of his 300th birthday. Hosted by our Prague-based Czech think tank, the Liberani Institute, this event, the 26th annual lecture, is a tribute to the enduring impact of Adam Smith's ideas, which have shaped the world as we know it today. As we embark on this joyous journey through time, we are reminded of the invaluable contributions of the Scottish philosopher and economist who dared to challenge the status quo. Tonight, we pay homage to the genius behind the wealth of nations and the theory of moral sentiments, masterpieces continued and enlightened and inspired generations of thinkers. Adam Smith's keen observations, profound insights, and unwavering belief in the power of individual freedom have left an indelible mark on economic theory, politics, and society at large. In true Adam Smith fashion, we aim to foster an atmosphere of intellectual curiosity and lively exchange of ideas. So, grab a glass of your favorite beverage, engage in enlightening, enlightening conversations, and allow your minds to soar as we explore the world through the lens of free markets, individual liberty, and the invisible hand. But fear not, dear attendees, for tonight is not just about profound discussions and deep contemplation. We invite you to indulge in the spirit of celebration for birthdays are meant to be joyous occasions. Let laughter fill the air and revel in the merriment as we toast to the legacy of Adam Smith, a man who revolutionized economic thought without losing our sense of humor. As we commemorate the birth of this intellectual luminary, let us also reflect on the relevance of his ideas in our modern world. From the bustling streets of Prague to the farthest corners of the globe, Adam Smith's teaching continued to guide us towards greater prosperity, self-reliance, and societal progress. I was an exchange student once in China. Even there, they had Adam Smith's statue in the university library, or Yadang Smith's statue, uh, I should say. No matter what script you use, to transcribe his name, no matter what language you use to talk about him, he remains a person to talk about, to sing about, to tweet about, to TikTok about, or to lecture about, as we are about to witness. So ladies and gentlemen, let us embark on this delightful journey together, a celebration of ideas of freedom and of the extraordinary intellectual legacy of Adam Smith. Tonight, we honor a man whose brilliance continues to shape the world and in doing so, we embrace the boundless possibilities that lie ahead. Cheers to Adam Smith's 300th birthday and to the enduring power of ideas that, trans that transcend time. Now, before I give the floor to other speakers, uh, a couple of organizational points. <laughs> we will hear short introductory remarks by various speakers who I will introduce before they'll talk, and then we will we will hear the, lecture, the annual lecture delivered by Professor Daniel Klein, which will then be followed by a Q&A session if the time allows it, because the band would be really upset if I didn't give them more time. Afterwards, we'll go back to the backyard where we will have a toast and a cake and stuff like this. And I will give additional instructions to that after the lecture. Now I will, now I will give the floor to Mr. Yuzi Schwartz, who is the president of the Anglo-American University, which is one of the sponsors of the books uh, that we published this year by Adam Smith. And I am very bad at history, so I had to Google 
when the unification of England and Scotland took place, because I wasn't sure if we were making a faux pas, uh, having a, a, an event to a, a celebration of a Scottish philosopher in, at a Anglo-American university. So I learned, and I'm happy to be corrected afterwards, uh, that it was shortly before Adam Smith was born that the unification took place. In a previous laureate of, a, of our annual award, Daniel Hannan, writes in one of his books that uh, it used to be more common before to refer to the, great, to the whole of Great Britain as England. So I hope that commemorating Adam Smith at the Anglo-American University is not a big faux pas, and I give the floor to you. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you here. It's a special pleasure for me because I am the only genuine founder of the Liberari Institute. <laughs> Being still connected with the Liberari Institute being invited for U.S. of Liberal Institute. <laughs> so because the others, so they were not so lucky. <clears throat> uh, just let me remember the year 2001, when the Liberal Institute published, published the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith that was original translation by the Berlin Institute, because the former Czech edition was from 50s, was from 50s, and the translation was, was affected, of course, by Marxist, Leninist economy, using also these, these terms, uh, because Adam, Adam Smith, together with um, William Petty and David Ricardo. So they were founders of Marxian political economy. Maybe so it's new information for you. <laughs> uh, but, but it was something that was in the textbook, in the communist textbook of economics. In 2001, at the, just at the launch of of this book, we invited Lord Harris of, of High Cross, Ralph Harris, the founder of Institute of Economic Affairs in London. That was the, the first institute of this sort in Europe. And two or three years after we translated Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, it was it was incredible work of our translators, and this book, so I, I think, was extremely important for understanding, for understanding Adam Smith's work in the Czech Republic, because it is not only this invisible hand. So there, are, there, there is morality, because Adam Smith was a moral philo philosopher. He's not the economist, but moral philosopher. And these moral aspects of, of free markets and free market economy is always necessary to stress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I will now give the floor to, Mr. to Dr. Lujek Sekira, who is also one of the sponsors of the two books that we republished for the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith's uh, birthday this year. Both the Wealth of Nations and the Theory of Moral Sentiments got a new edition this year. And uh, he sponsored them and he wrote the check forward to the Theory of Moral Sentiments. So you have the floor. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for invitation. I am pleased that uh, my foundation could support this important work of 
Adam Smith. I have very strong uh, personal connection with this book because I have in my library first edition from 1759. Wow. And uh, <laughs> I have the collection of first edition of philosophical book. And my foundation is one of the leading supporters of moral and political philosophy, not only in Europe, but in the world. We have strong connection with Oxford University. We created or recreated uh, all this professorship uh, philosophy at Oxford, uh, which is now called the Sekira and White Professorship of Moral Philosophy, established 1621. We have uh, very deep cooperation with Harvard University supported in the last two years to be conferences on John Rawls. And uh, we also have the Center for Philosophy, Ethics and Religion at the Charles University in Prague. Mm. Adam Smith is one of the most important figures uh, uh, extraordinary intellectual effort that was the Scottish Enlightenment. A student of the moral philosopher Francis Hutchison and David Hume, he was the clearly one of the most influential British philosophers of 18th century. Throughout the history of ideas, we don't find many figures with both a marked impact on ethics and a fundamental impact on economics. In his book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, first published 1759, he developed an extremely original manner, the center of concept of sympathy, which we also find in the work of predecessors, such as Shaftesbury, Hutchison, and his colleagues and contemporaries, such as Hume. For him, sympathy is a moral sentiment, a kind of reflection of feelings, passion, and the state of others, which approaches the, those others are mirror in the consciousness and ideas as precondition of the sympathetic relationship towards them. This is the foundation of Smithsonian moral theory and draws us closer to the healing consolation of the mutual sympathy. In this interpretation, sympathy includes not only compassion and togetherness, but also the idea of market intermingling with the broad-based empathy. The second important concept <clears throat> of Smithsonian moral philosophy is the impartial spectator. His stance is an expression of the moral standards and in the first edition also in consensual values and social stat status. Smith was acutely aware of the disillusion with the social dynamics of rapidly emerging capitalism and this led him in the sixth and final edition in 1790 to a transformation of the impartial spectator in his words, the man within the breast who became a representative of virtuous few. Smith who chosen one face the growing marketplace of desire, which represented the best of consumer society at the tail of end of the 18th century. Uh, concept of uh, um, impartial spectator is extremely influential in moral philosophy. Thomas Nagel, one of the leading uh, moral philosophers at New York University, published the book View from Nowhere, which is deeply influenced by the concept of impartial spectator. The ideal of individualistic agrarian capitalism produced by enterprising individuals started to fade away. Smith saw the surreptitious seeds of erosion of his model, which was so admired by liberal economic elites of 20th century, such as Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich August von Hayek. This also strengthened his mistrust in large trade and joint stock companies with monopolistic tendencies, especially the East India Company. This is the paradox that uh, almost lifelong employees of this company was the leading liberal in 19th century John Stuart Mill. The liberal critical reflection of the rapidly developing capitalism found strong expression in throughout critic by Marx which reached a fundamentally erroneous conclusion. However, recently, recently a wide aging response in this sense was awoken by the Thomas Piketty, comprehensive critic of capitalism's tendency to produce asset inequality. 
with all due respect for his analysis. If the causes of growing inequality, one cannot agree with his conclusion. Uh, calling for intervention, regulation, and redistribution. We must always keep in mind that the market environment is not only the causes of economic inequality, but also a primary source of the social wealth. It cannot be overlooked that the freedom, aut autonomy, and democracy founded in a neutral institution are a result of market competition. Smith's position as a founder of economic liberalism often raised the question about the mutual relationship of his ethical thinking as a role in the wealth of nations, his most influential works on economics. The concept of sympathy or the impartial spectator are replaced by the concept of self-interest and invisible hand. Of the market, in this work, self-interest is stronger than the altruism and entrepreneur's selfish interest in profit in turn satisfy the needs of the members of society. This apparent contradiction led several com commentators to the conclusion, conclusion that his work has two completely different sides. That he arrived at a, ra a radical change in his perspective of social reality. Nevertheless, on the closer inspection of his work, we can see incoherence of the thought, since economic concept cannot be properly understood without an ethical context. I believe that the link that connects the two is the prudence. Smith's most important virtue, not only an expression of the self-interest, but a precondition for sympathy. As a rule, only the satisfaction of one's own self-interest open up possibility for sympathy with the needs of others and ability to care for them. Prudence is a characteristic which allows for the options and opinions of others. It is characteristic which oscillates between selfish, self-love and benevolence, as kindness, affection and tolerance. It is a symbol of the tension between the market environment and moral attitudes. This generating societal movement, prudence is also a source of legitimacy for spontaneously establish norms and principles which have a generic regulatory function, both in ethics and in economic environments. A prudent person can be both, can a businessman and benevolent and generous patron, a moral person, standard creator, and this an impartial founder, a framework for the invisible hand of the market. The latter not only coordinates individual choosing, Choices and neutralize conflict, but also molds individuals into social creatures. In this interpretation, the market takes us out of the isolation, which spontaneous allocation of resources and the fulfillment of needs mixed with the interaction of entities who are in competition with each other, yet express mutual sympathy. Prudence can be approached as a step towards something more structured. Which I, call, which I call ethics of wealth, ethics of surplus, which should evoke not only pleasure, but responsibility and empathy. This highly desirable line of reasoning, which deserves to be developed, as it offers a liberal value approach as an alternative to the compelling yet dysfunctional egalitarian models. In contrast to one dim dimensional world of private economic interest. They will be drawn in by the original moral reflection on human relationship and attitudes. The breath and the death of the Marx, of the Adam Smith thematic scope is astonishing. For me, he and David Hume are the most inspirational of the British moralist and alongside with Kant, both have profoundly influenced my own ethical thinking. I recommend all of you this book for inspirational study. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another sponsor of the of the books, uh, Mr. Sosyev Pliyov. Please join us and tell us some uh, wisdoms that you learned from the books. Otherwise.
as Martin said, you know, uh, he asked me today, two hours before his meeting, to to give some speech, and asked me to give, to say something uh, clever and smart. Uh, I will try to accomplish at least at least half of it. I will try to say something. Uh, Martin, uh, I sponsored this uh, this book, and I sponsor books from Liberal Institute for a decade, I think, pretty much every every single of them. And not because I like uh, giving speeches, but because I like books. So I hope you all guys enjoy this book. I hope the Brown Institute will keep publishing more and more books. I can promise you can count on my support. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, and we will hold you to that. <laughs> and uh, to officially introduce Adam Smith and today's lecture on behalf of our institute, I would like to introduce our chief economist who finally came from America, <laughs> Mr. Izzy Yamnel. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm absolutely delighted and humbled to welcome you here at the celebration of Adam Smith 300th birthday. I'm always enthusiastic about events at Liberani Institute, but this one is even more extraordinary to me. Adam Smith and his work has a very special place in my personal journey towards classical liberalism and was instrumental in me finding Liberani Institute in early 2000s and later joining the Institute in 2018. I would like to share a few personal remarks together with my views on connection of Adam Smith work to the development of Czech Republic's market and political institutions. I first encountered Adam Smith on the shelf of my grandfather's library. It was before the first appearance of Liberal Institute edition in 2001. The book I held in my hands back then, in late 1990s, was the first full Czech translation of The Wealth of Nation from 1958. This book was quite understandably accompanied by a vividly written preface explaining why it is important to publish The Wealth of Nations in the country striving to reach the ideal of communist society. To this day, I consider the preface to be illustrative to the history of economic thought in the Czech Republic. If you have a stomach for it, I am happy to share all 18 pages with you. <laughs> anyway, one of the striking parts of the preface is acknowledgement of the importance of Smith's argument in later development of Marxian exploitation theory, together with bashing the work of prominent Czech liberal economist Karl English. In contrast, it is enlightening to open English textbook from 1940s, where he, uh, in the recommended liter literature section, references the wealth of nation as a resource written by one of the very few listed foreign authors. Reading Adam Smith was a revelation at his ideas could describe puzzles I have encountered as a child observing a transition from the grace of unified totalitarian society to the colorful diversity of the free society. I remember that I asked my grandfather about Adam Smith because his work was mentioned by the leading politician of the era, Václav Klaus. Klaus emphasized wealth of nations as an inspiration leading to Czech pathway in economic transition, as well as coupon privatization. The first publication of Czech translation of the theory of moral sentiments in 2005, oh, to, to 2005 somehow missed me, and my first engagement happened when I have studied with our distinguished speaker uh, and the recipient of this year's annual award, Professor Daniel Klein almost a decade later. Reading Terror of Moral Sentiment had profound impact on my thinking. 
Besides other things, it explains the puzzles of my experience growing up in transitioning country in more depth and detail. I got to appreciate how Smith in both instrumental books developed a coherent theory of social interaction while self-interest and sympathy plays complementary, not substituting roles. On the market, the order is derived from willingness to pay a price and in the realm of culture, the morals are a result of approval and disapproval of our fellow citizens. In both, coherence is found in decentralized discovery and coordination. Smith famously argued that we desire not only to be loved, but also to be lovely. This statement may evoke a pause for a modern economist. However, it provides an important insight it forces us to contemplate if it is not indeed the case that human characteristics of individual economizing agents are those which allow for the smoothness of the market process. These thoughts bring me to another important figure of Czech transition, Václav Havel. Havel was a leading proponent of an argument that decentralized, decentralized civil society create, creates balance to the centralized political power. The well-known Havel Klaus debate, to a certain extent, formed our current institutions and created an apparent tensions not dissimilar to the widely discussed Das Adam Smith problem. This then encouraged a question. Are the theory of moral sentiments and wealth of nations in contradiction? I don't believe they are. They, the thoughtful reading and implementing of Smithian ideas as an intertwined system of market and morals can bring us to a better perception of social issues through the perspective of, to use Vernon Smith phrase, humanomics. Years have passed and we did experience ever widening gap between arguments for profits and markets and arguments for morals and civil society. Instead of classical liberal synthesis of the two. Recent political discourse is driven by struggle between simple populism on one hand and sophisticated technocratic governance on the other. I perceive the work of Adam Smith more important now than ever. With new editions of Wealth of Nations and the Theory of Moral Sentiments, we are encouraging Czech readers to contemplate Smith's work as a true synthesis of interconnected networks of interested and disinterested commerce, while sympathy, uh, where sympathy and self-interest are two sides of the same coin. Emphasizing Smith's warning, which penetrates through both of his celebrated works, that power would nowhere be so dangerous as in the hands of a man of systems who has a folly and presumption enough to fancy himself fit to exercise it. I am delighted to introduce another lecture by Professor Daniel Klein, one of the world's most esteemed Smithian scholars, and I invite you to wonderful journey of Adam Smith's Berlin synthesis of a system of societal cooperation among, among neighbor, neighbors and nations. Good evening, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. I find myself in tremendous sympathy with all of the preceding remarks. Uh, they've uh, anticipated a lot of what I have to say, in fact. Anyway, I'm just very grateful to you, Martin, for, for making, for, for an interest, this great interest in, in uh, Smith and in liberalism and for all the great work you do. You know, I come from America, and some people are saying, make America great again, MAGA. I say, Mela. Make Europe liberal again. How's that? Ma mela, mela is the, the way to put it. All right. So I hope this will work for us. Let's see. That looks good. And uh, I don't have a screen here, so I apologize. So I'm going to be turning my back just to see what we're talking about quite a bit. Um, but so it is the 300th. And uh, um, 
not only is it the 300th year, but it's the 300th month. He was born this month, um, it, and it's actually, it, oh, is it going to show up there? Oh, that would be cool. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, he was born on his gravestone. It says June 5th, but there was a calendar change, 11-day calendar change in 1752, and so it's actually June 16th, according to our counting. Okay, so I think that's, we, a year is a year to us. So June 16th, I guess, is the birth date, the actual 300th birth date. Um, yeah, as Jerry indicated, I do work on Adam Smith. So in some ways, you know, you can think of me as an intellectual historian who is here to say some things about what Adam Smith thought. I want to say that I'm also very Smithian. So in other words, I believe in Adam Smith. So when I say, here's what Adam Smith thought, basically, I'm also saying, here's what you should think. Okay? <laughs> so it's both. Okay? Um, I can see here we got it. You guys did a great logo for this evening. Um, so I want to show you this. This is a picture of GDP per person from the year 1000 to 1750 does it it's pretty flat here as you can see right up to about 1750 and then bang look at that and we've got the world europe the u.s they all go up quite dramatically that's something to explain that's something to explain and there's different ways to explain it a lot of different people offer explanations and i want to offer an adam smith explanation which is that he brought about different ways of thinking which led to different ways of doing uh business and commerce and different ways of doing public policy so he actually led to important changes in human conduct he was a moral philosopher first as the gentleman I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't have everyone's name straight, but was indicating with 1759 in the theory of moral sentiments, very established as a moral theorist. With great moral authority, he got appointed to Glasgow as a professor of moral philosophy after he published the theory of moral sentiments. He was very well regarded. He was kind of a first among his peers, kind of a cultural royalty. And Scotland was kind of a peak in the cultural landscape of Europe. So this is a big guy with a lot of moral authority. And then in 1776, he morally authorizes certain things. And that helps seal the deal on certain trends. It's not like he invented all of this or, or was the only guy, but he was an important capstone to Come, come out and come across with this. And it helps to have a 900-page book that people, you know, are afraid to criticize because first they have to read it. Although he's a good strategy. Pickety knows how to play that game. Um, so I'm a little warm. I'm going to tell you something. Um, so what happened here? And by the way, Deirdre McCloskey calls this the great enrichment, the blade of the hockey stick. Um... Oh, yeah, I could see it over there. Um, yeah, by the way, so he's, those dates there, he died in 1790, just shortly after the French Revolution gets started. Um, and this is a picture due to my, my friend and colleague, Eric Madsen. And this diagram's actually, the main themes I have to say tonight, which are about these moral authorizations. And there's really two wings of it here. You can see the economic philosophy in the center here with Smith speaking different messages here. Here, the moral authorization is saying, pursuing honest... Could you take the microphone up to the... If you okay. Sure. Should I do that? Okay. I don't want to break it. I don't know. It's not mine. That's... Uh, yeah. Great. I have to speak into this one to get on the recording, I understand, so I can't wander too far. Um, so, the, this one here is about honest income. 
honest income, money, wealth. And he said, you know what? It's kind of in our genes, and it's been in a lot of our traditions to kind of say, you know, no rich man gets to heaven, and the poor inherit the earth, and so on. But actually, God is okay with pursuing honest income. In fact, he approves of it, because he sees that by your making honest income, you actually help serve his great family of children, that is, all of humankind, the whole, the ethical whole that matters. So he's morally authorizing the pursuit of honest income. And this was very striking. It was evolving and coming. He wasn't totally original in this way by any means. In fact, clerics in the church were doing it, like William Baxter and Perkins and uh, uh, um, Samuel Butler. Um, no, well, I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm, uh, I'm getting my butlers confused. Joseph Butler and his teacher at Glasgow, Fra uh, Francis Hutchison. And so this, this creates a focus on honest income and in, a, a pride, a boldness, an invigoration. It also says, hey, innovate. You got some new ideas? You got an idea for a whole new line of business, a whole new line of work, stuff that people hadn't heard of that they're going to like and pay you for and you're going to make honest income from? Go for it. The principle is quite general. It's okay to pursue, even praiseworthy, to pursue honest income. So you get this great invigoration and you get innovation, dynamism. And that is really what drives that blade of the hockey stick up. And on the other side, he's telling the lawmakers, the aristocrats, many of whom he was buddies with, you know what? Let people pursue honest income. Trust them. It works out for the good of the whole. So he's endorsing the liberal principle, the liberty principle. He put it as allowing every man to pursue his own interest his own way. So this is, these are the two moral authorizations that made the blade of the hockey stick. It wasn't a specific te technological uh, discovery. It wasn't slavery. It wasn't the discovery of the new world that all of a sudden something happened, something like that. It was actually this moral, big moral change. It was the crest of the liberal era. There's a, whole, there's a whole historical process going on here, which I'm going to talk about. And then this really kind of gels and crystallizes and goes public so that now everyone in the marketplace, marketplace feels emboldened to, to, to vigorously pursue honest income and to innovate. And in, that politicians feel obliged to liberalize and to stop restricting people as much as they have. And that's what happened. That's the explanation. So in a way, Adam Smith did that. Pretty good. <laughs> I mean, again, it's not really just Adam Smith, but it's what he kind of represents and symbolizes, you could say. And just like you, sir, I agree. David Hume and Adam Smith are the, the, cream, the, the creme de la creme, right? <laughs> Um, I also like Edmund Burke a lot too, by the way. So that's the pursuit, that's the expression I'm using, the pursuit of honest income. Yeah, that's right, I can look over here. Um, uh, allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way, upon the liberal plan. I want to remind you, if you don't know, the word liberal goes way back, even in Latin, but it didn't have a political meaning until now, until then. It had a morals meaning, a, a personal meaning of generous, virtuous, the kind of virtues that are becoming of a free man. Um, but it wasn't until the 1770s that Smith and some of his British friends christened their philosophy liberal. That is the first political meaning of the word so Smithian liberalism is liberalism 1.0. And let's never forget that. And I think we should stick with it. 
Because what it, you know, sometimes they say, oh, they took that word and they changed the meaning that it means something else to people. So we got to come up with a new word so it's clear to people. So they're going to steal that one too, right? So if we try to come up with a new word, the same thing's going to happen if we succeed in establishing a new word. Anyway, we might as well stick with Adam Smith and the tradition. It's our 300 years, okay? So liberal. Um, like I said, he christens the philosophy liberal. This is an engram analysis that proves what I'm saying. I won't explain this, but this, this proves it in these expressions. Liberal principles, liberal policy, liberal ideas, liberal system, liberal government, liberal clan. Bang. It started here with William Robertson, and, it, and these guys seemed to almost have a, something of a conspiracy <laughs> to launch this word because they did, and it took life and carried on ever after. I want to remind you that Britain finally established a kind of integrated polity, a kind of integrated nation state with a stable functional government, especially in, in the early 18th century. And that is a kind of condition which we're accustomed to and we tend to not think about and just presuppose, but you know, most of history didn't really look like that. You could think about the English Civil War and the craziness and all the inner conflict and instability that was going on uh, during the 17th century in Britain. Uh, and finally, it got settled down. And this is an important presupposition of Hume and Smith's political thinking, I would say, and their advocacy of the liberal principle allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way, and the government kind of being confined in what it undertakes. They're kind of presupposing, you know, that we've got this. And that's not always something you can presuppose. So it does become an issue in a lot of political discussions on the continent into the 18th and still 19th nation state formation think about germany think about italy think about just about think about here no doubt i don't need to tell you about that so there is this like this important almost british sort of presupposition to the whole liberal political philosophy and let me add that i think christianity made liberalism possible I can elaborate on that, but I'm very big on this theme. I've become quite a Christian hugger. I am agnostic myself. Um, I hope there's a God as advertised, and I'd be delighted to learn that there is. But um, I don't know. I don't know either way. But anyhow, um, this Larry Siegenthal book develops, I think, a very powerful argument. It makes a lot of sense to me. And I don't think um, we ever really would have had the whole liberal arc and liberal civilization without Christianity. <clears throat> and that flows back to Judaism, but I think Christianity specifically is an important advance. P.J. Hill has talked about this in this paper. All right. Just as background. So, as I said, over several centuries there was this development. And I want to kind of pick up the story real quick from the printing press, which I think is a very major, very major development. Because before that, you had not so much di 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 difference or disagreement or even competition in thinking because people didn't really have a way to broadcast some alternative interpretation, alternative to the, the church and the rulers. But the printing press busted things open to different interpretations, different interpretations of the world, of scripture, of moral duty, of everything. And of course, we got war in a huge way. And religion's a big part of those wars, the wars of religion, people tearing each other apart over this as they all tried to figure out the best way to organize society and lead everybody together to the true interpretation. Until finally, they kind of said, this isn't working. And things settled down, and we started getting more of an idea of, hey, maybe the government shouldn't be leading and tending how we all feel together and what's all important to each of us. So there's a switch that goes on towards toleration, 
Meanwhile, there's development of print culture, the public, the people. And there's this new focus, instead of the government leading the highest things in, more, in a moral sense, to safeguarding the lowest things, not being messed with, not being threatened, not being stolen from by your neighbors, okay? Us as subjects, not messing with each other. The new focus in political thought was to focus on that and then to work out in jurisprudence what that meant. What's the operating system here that we're going to try to secure and then let people do their own thing with? So this is all happening, you know, centuries before Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. It's a very important part of the story. Um, <clears throat> And it does lead to, or, or flow into Adam Smith. And this is what Meltzer says here, what I've just been saying about this shift from the higher things, I'll move forward. See, each of us, we look for meaning in life. We look for the more enduring things that we define ourselves by, that we commit ourselves to, that we find, that we, we, we turn to our family, our pride, our career, our achievements, our beliefs, our convictions, our football teams, right? <laughs> Those are the higher things in life. And then there's the more mundane day-to-day -day things, right? Like uh, our car, which we hope isn't scratched when we come out or isn't stolen. Um, and so that's the thing, is that the government used to be in the business, along with the church, together to a great extent, leading the higher things for the community altogether in a kind of encompassing shared experience. Whereas the new philosophy, after they saw that that created a heck of a lot of war, because we each developed different ideas about higher things, about human meaning, um, that we're going to focus on the lower things subdividing these rights and duties through jurisprudence and that leads to basically Adam Smith and saying look we have reason to believe that um, if we let people operate on this it'll work out pretty well it works out better than the alternative it's not perfect but we think better than the alternative and that's really the philosophy it does say about the higher space the liberal philosophy I mean, all of us do speak to people, if we speak as liberals, trying to persuade them, don't find your meaning in collectivist politics. Don't make that your religion. So don't, we do say to that person in their higher space, don't go over here. Don't go over here, okay? But then that leaves all of this. And we don't really have very specific advice there. That's about people's own pursuits. It's their responsibility. And a lot of people don't like that responsibility, which is one reason maybe they're not always that receptive to the message. But we do monkey in that sense with the higher space by saying, don't go over there at least. Um, it leaves the rest open. And in that sense, we do care, care about the higher things, the sacred things. We're often accused of forsaking virtue, of forsaking the higher things. And I don't think that's true, and I, don't, I certainly don't think it's true of Adam Smith. But it's also true that Smith and liberalism per se doesn't give specific guidance to the individual up there. I say it's better than the alternatives. It's not based on some specific maximan. Now, in Smith's morally authorizing this message, it's okay to pursue honest income. Again, what does it mean, honest income? What do you mean by honest, especially? And that's, again, where this jurisprudence stuff comes in and which he flows out of. Here's his teacher here, Francis Hutchison, who also did a book on natural jurisprudence. And as Buckle argues, it's very appropriate to make Hume part of that natural law tradition. Maybe you agree. Um, uh, and that's been somewhat controversial, but I think it's, it's right. It's just that he's a very creative 
type of natural law thinker. So here's another kind of historical look at this. You've got the natural jurisprudence people and political theorists there, and you got Hume and Smith here who are quite alike. The word liberal coming forward in Smith's day, specifically the 1770s, and we could extend that backward and kind of call those other people proto-liberals, perhaps. But this is a much longer arc than just like Adam Smith made it happen in the 18th century. And this was his first book, A Theory of Moral Sentiments. It treats the virtues you are to practice, and it includes all the virtues of beneficence, friendship, charity, fortitude, courage, prudence, as you noted, uh, and so on. And all of those virtues, he says, are very subtle and depend on a sense of propriety that you feel in the moment, kind of like you feel whether it's a good movie. Do you have a formula for a good movie? No. It has rules, but they're not precise and accurate rules. They're loose, vague, and indeterminate. You couldn't even really explain them. But you do have definite opinions and judgments about whether a movie is good. And that's the way it is with almost all the virtues, except one. This is the impartial spectator, by the way. I'm going to skip that because that's complicated <laughs> and in the interest of time. We can come back if you like. But except one, commutative justice, rules of person, owning your person, respecting actually the integrity, the integrity of your physical person, not punching someone in the face. Property, as he says here, possessions and property. And finally, promises due. That's keeping your promises, fulfilling your contracts. And those develop to be precise and accurate. Okay, we know whether someone scratched our car. We know what it means to scratch a car, to damage property, to steal property, to punch someone in the face. That's not so complicated and subtle and a matter of opinion. It's precise and accurate. And because it's quite clear, we can enforce against it with force. With force. And we do. Even among private citizens, we do. We defend ourselves. We punch back. Justifiably. So... This is a very special virtue, and this is what the jurisprudence guys are talking about to a great extent. What makes commutative justice? What is the stuff that's covered by commutative justice? Commutative is one of several senses of justice. What is the stuff? Whose is it? Whose is it? What makes it yours rather than mine? Or is it perhaps nobody's? Maybe it's unowned, like the atmosphere, or maybe some water in the ocean. That's what Hugo Grotius started writing about. The ocean is unowned, and we should, no one has a right to exclude us. The, the, um, the Portuguese don't have a right to exclude us from the uh, East Indies, and so on. And what counts is messing with it. When have you violated a contract? When have you damaged someone's property? One of you hurt somebody's person. Um, and all of this is understood within historical context, but there is a uniformity among history for any societies that get anywhere in the world. You're not going to get anywhere as a society. You're not going to even survive if neighbors are messing terribly with each other's stuff. If we're all stealing each other's stuff all the time, no one's going to develop and accumulate stuff. You're not going to invest without the confidence of being able to secure the fruit of your investment. And so there's in history a uniformity about the community to a great extent respecting each other's stuff defined in this way. And that's like an important lesson and an important source of this kind of justice, okay? Now, as Pocock pointed out, this was happening in the 17th century, people talking about all this. 
the child of this is liberalism because it gets flipped around and people start saying, yeah, 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 so we should not mess with each other's stuff. The government should not let any of us mess with each other's stuff. Oh, and you know what? Maybe the government also shouldn't mess with our stuff. They start applying the principle of I own my stuff and it's kind of sacred against the government. And this is a radical idea and a bold idea. Now, liberty is the flip side. Remember, community of justice is others not messing with your stuff. And um, no, community of justice, I'm sorry, is the duty of not messing with other people's stuff. Flip that around, others not messing with your stuff. When we speak of the superior inferior relationship in a, in a political sense, that's liberty. That's the modern idea of liberty. And as Hume and Smith said, it is a modern idea. Taking this jurisprudence concept, we take it for granted, but it had to be spelled out as a kind of operating system in jurisprudence, and then it turned into political theory that defined modern liberty, as Benjamin Constant put it, modern liberty versus ancient liberty. And so that's what Smith is doing. Okay, and so that idea of liberty, whose flip side is commutative justice, is really the spine of this liberalism. And it's a very sound spine and a proper spine. And as I say, in The Wealth of Nations, he then morally authorizes those two things. The pursuit of honest income, honest meaning you're not messing with other people's stuff and you make money, and the other wing is telling the lawmaker, let people do this. Unleash the free market. Um, and so here's just a, this picture again of higher and lower things. Here's commutative justice, which is really about lower things, my stuff not being messed with. And in 1776, there was another famous document that was, that appeared called the Declaration of Independence, principally written by Thomas Jefferson. And it has a listing, a famous phrase that lists three things at the lower, life, liberty. Remember, these were the first and the second in Smith's quotation about the most sacred laws of, uh, he, remember, Smith had life, li life, property, and promises do. So here's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the high thing for you to figure out in the liberal nation state. A lot of people don't like that message, but they should. They should learn to like it. We got to plead with them. We got to educate them <laughs> to like it. All right. So that's kind of how we got that. And again, my friend and Eric Manson developed this picture again, where you see this one is the uh, to the kind of the policymaker, which then feeds back as liberalization in the marketplace in terms of government policy changing, and this one feeds back to invigoration with innovation, and we get that kind of self-feeding upward spiral that we see in the picture. And we see the presumption of liberty being taught very clearly in the wealth of nations. This is just one of the famous quotes. Um, and this emphasis on, it's okay for you to focus on what you know and what's important to you. And here's Smith's reasoning in both books. Your moral responsibility as a child of God is to advance the good of the whole, the good of the whole that God as a universal beholder beholds. That sounds really oppressive. I got to advance the good of the whole? Always? Constantly? Uh, wait a second. Remember, though, this. You are part of the whole. And furthermore, your most effective way of advancing the good of the whole is to work on those parts where you 
can be effective where you have the knowledge and the control and the accountability and the feedback to actually make a difference. And where is that? Well, it's very close to home. That's you. Your own happiness is part of the whole. Your, your responsibility to advance the good of the whole isn't about other people. It's about everyone, including you. And since your, your, your most effective act activities are actually with you, with your family, with your friendship circles, with your church, with your neighborhood, with your sports club, with your workplace. That's actually, you're authorized to focus there because God recognizes that you're not effective once you get far from home. You got nothing but crappy signals about what serves the good of the whole, the good of the whole. You don't have good correction mechanisms when you start going the wrong way. But when you're at home, just like you were saying, sir, you've gotten the marketplace profit and loss, which is a very clear signal about whether to continue and expand in an activity or whether to withdraw and reform an activity. If you're making losses, you're persisting in making losses, they're kind of getting a signal of Hey, you got to change your plan. You got to try something else. You got to do something different. If you're making a lot of profits, it's saying, keep it up, keep doing it. And then what else it says to you, hey, that guy's making a lot of profits here. I'm going to get in with this sack. And so she starts competing and offering consumers similar products, trying to do the same thing that first guy's doing. And that drives down prices. It leads again to in innovation. It leads to consumer surplus. Those are the good mechan healthy correction mechanisms in economics and also in private morals. If you're doing stuff that only alienates people, that only is disagreeable, it do not achieve sympathy, and not achieving sympathy is universally unpleasant to human beings. You're not going to have friends. You're not going to have influence. You're not going to get on in the world. And in private morals, in the private sector, that too has an invisible hand. It's somewhat different. It doesn't have the monetary system. It doesn't have a price system. So it is a different set of mechanisms, but the importance of local knowledge and feedback is similar. So that too has an invisible hand. In government, it doesn't work that way. In government, it does not work that way. They never admit their mistakes. And they have a power which no one else has, which is to coerce people. And they do it on a colossal scale, and they do it overtly. They put up a website. This is how much of your income we're going to take. And if you try to stop us, we're going to want a gun in your face. And they put up a website about all these other restrictions that limit competition for their favorite friends and allies, or for themselves. And they've created printing presses of their own monopoly money, which is another way they support their activities, which we cannot do. So in politics, Smith said, there's not the same set of healthy mechanisms. And that's why we cannot unbridle ambition in politics. That's why politics still needs so much conscience and virtue. Whereas you can tell a guy in the marketplace, a businessman, Pursue honest income. Keep it honest. And, you know, you can be pretty confident you're going to be on the right track in God's eyes. But you can't tell a politician, be ambitious. There's no simple way to just, you know, the guy to stay ambitious and stay right by God in politics because it doesn't have the same set of mechanisms. Okay, so this is what he's saying here. From, from the Wealth of Nations. He also says it in the Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, there's a great deal of dynamism that comes from the liberal plan. That upset people a lot. Smith didn't emphasize it as much as uh, you might expect him to. And there's interesting discussion about why you don't see that more clearly in Smith's writing. It could be that he didn't know or anticipate it dynamism, innovation, disruption, disjointedness, fragmentation, 
confusion, breakdowns of community. The liberal plan does lead to a lot of this. Very dynamic and market and social experience. And of course, that became a big source of complaint after Smith when people experienced the free market. So why didn't Smith recognize or discuss this? Maybe, again, he didn't anticipate it and mount the argument to withstand it. Maybe he had an idea that that would come, but he, wouldn't, he didn't want to scare off the people he was trying to appeal to. He didn't want to say, this is going to be scary, but I want you to sign on to this. So maybe he understated some of the troubling sides of the liberal plan, as this author suggests. Um, yeah, so these are all some of the points as a kind of review. Um, let me note that the word liberal later changed its meaning around here when the end of the 19th century, the Liberal Party in Britain itself changed its character, changed its tune, and a new sense of liberal called new liberalism came and then to distinguish the classical Smithian liberalism from this new liberalism, people had to talk about old liberalism because now there were two liberalisms. And that's when this started and it really came forward in uh, North America. The Liberal Party goes out of business when the Labor Party takes over their place. And so it was really in the US later that uh, left sense of liberal really caught on big and get then also got um, important in Canada. So you kind of have three phases of liberalism, the original liberalism 1.0, sort of democracy in general, and then beginning in the end of the 19th century, basically leftism, the governmentalization of social affairs. And these are guys that specifically promoted it as new liberalism. Now it's called social liberalism sometimes. Um, I do think that while we're talking about what the policies should be that the lawmaker makes, Smith's very pro-liberty, pro-liberalization, but I do want to point out that in terms of what? In terms of the structure of government and its constitution, He's rather conservative in many respects. So I do think conservative liberalism is a sensible term for Hume, Smith, and Burke. I elaborate that in that paper. So these are all perennial points. You know, we're still human beings. Human nature has not changed. Those points about you're part of the whole. How do you help? The, you're morally obliged to serve the good of the whole. How do you do that? You serve the parts that you can make better. And that's close to home. It really is. Um, and, that, and that's why, um, that's why you want to authorize people to focus on where they're effective. And furthermore, in this bigger, bigger world, the modern world, we're not in the band anymore. You know, our ancestors 10,000 years ago were in little bands of 40 people. And that inheritance is still in our genes. And that was a small little experience where common experience and knowledge about the good of the whole was quite apparent. After all, it's just 40 people. All you care about is your band. But now we care about all of humankind, or at least our consciences make us align to that, even if we don't really care which is understandable because we're human, and Smith pointed this out. So when it's such a big hole and a complex hole, we can't recreate the band approach, which means government is not going to work. These big plans for the government to make the whole so much better and bigger simply is not possible because of knowledge problems, because of incentive problems, and so on. So. What Smith is telling us from the 1700s 
um, is still completely relevant today. And it's just a crying shame that it's not more popular uh, and influential, but it's alive and well, and uh, we're celebrating it here, and that's, that's super. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Professor Klein, for your great lecture. Um, thank you for your attention. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Um, we have time for like three very brief questions, I think, and then we'll leave it to the informal session afterwards. If there are any questions after such a great lecture. <laughs> there was a part about, there was actually a part about not messing with your things and people should make money by not messing with other people's things. How would you explain when you park somewhere where you're not allowed to park, someone comes and tows your car away? <laughs> um, well, um, I would say, well, first of all, if it was a parking lot that's privately owned, it's pretty straightforward that you're probably messing with the rules of that private resource. Um, but I would apply the same principle to a parking lot that's governmentally owned. I mean, I recognize that as a form of ownership and the government should make rules for the resources it owns. And so, you know, I think uh, unless there's some capriciousness or, or poor signage or they don't let people know or something, it might be a little harsh. I don't know the exact situation, but at some point you do have to enforce the rules. And you've messed with the parking lot. You've messed with the parking lot. And if nobody respects the rules, even of government resources, no, that's not, that's not virtuous. Adam Smith would definitely disapprove. That's part of the conservatism, perhaps. Other questions? Um, I wonder what you said you are morally obliged to serve the whole, right? That's, that's the paraphrasing what you're saying. You're morally obliged to serve the whole. The good of the whole. Right, the good of the whole. Uh, if we read not just the political programs of the socialist parties, but I think also the uh, conservative parties, so-called right-wing parties, I think we would find everywhere things like uh, solidarity, common good, social welfare, and everything. And from that, one would imply why is politics so corrupt? You know, we sort of like, seems to, we sort of like the ideas, you know, they're all about common welfare, and good of the whole, and this private interest is sort of suspicious and whatever. So one would imply, so the problem must be in politics, right? The politics is the problem. So. The politicians are corrupt, and they're not serving this whole. They're they're pursuing their uh, corrupt interests. You know, maybe maybe there is some uh, yeah. uh, wrong side of of of, of uh, self-interest and so forth. And I I would challenge the whole approach. I would think, what if it's not just uh, what if it's not that we have the right morality. Uh, which we see everywhere in, in these programs, right ideas about what moral is, uh, and only the politics is corrupt. What if the morality is not right? What if the right morality is not to serve others as a primary? Uh, uh, not, I said it's not serve others. others. It's not serve others. Serve, serve the whole. That's serve the whole. Yeah. And you're, you're part of the whole. Right. So, but, you're but, part of the whole. All right, but it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not the pursuit of private, rational interest in the first place, right? It's not that. It's serving the whole, whatever you call it, social effort and everything. So I would, I would ask, shouldn't we pause and think about was Smith right in, first of all, fully embracing Hume's morality, almost fully saying, reason is outside morality. Uh, rules of reason are not Conclude, uh, rules of morality are not conclusions of reason, right? Should we challenge this basic assumptions, this basic assumption, when we talk about self-interest, what self-interest actually is? Is it what Hume said, or, or Bernard Mandeville said, or, or Smith said? Shouldn't we start there instead of 
accepting morality. These, These are great questions, questions and it's uh, opportunities for great discussions. Uh, yes, we should ask about these fundamental formulations and ethics and our duties. Um, and, and yes, I have asked and thought about those questions and I've come to my conclusions and yes, Smith is right. Um, no, you don't want to throw, you're throwing the baby out with the bath water. Just because politicians say they're about serving the good of the whole and then they don't, and you're very unhappy with all their propaganda, all their lies, all their terrible policies and bad results, it, means, it might just mean they're not doing that. It could be because they're corrupt, it could be because they're foolish, and they're, they're in some sense sincere, but terribly foolish. I think that's part of the story as well. But whatever it is, I mean, there's no way to build a morality that doesn't make the good of the whole supreme. There's no, you're not gonna be able to in any way justify whatever you want to be the defining feature, the primary feature of morality, unless you can say that that serves the good of the whole. And if you look at Murray Rothbard or Ayn Rand or anyone else, they all end up doing exactly that. They all say, oh, and by the way, this works out for the good of the whole. What a coincidence. Gee, isn't that funny? No, it's not a coincidence. It's because they know they're compelled by their human nature to set up, to do morality that way. And they don't like, they, they have maybe beefs with some of these formulations that come out of Christianity, that come out of benevolent monotheism, because God is a universal benevolent beholder. What does a benevolent beholder find beautiful? The good of the whole that it beholds. It's benevolent. Okay? And that's, 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 that's what we're dealing with. Don't run away from that. You're, if you do, you throw the baby out with the bath water. In my view. And that's why Smith is better than most of the 20th century liberal philosophers. In my view. Or it's, part of, it's part of why it's better. I would like to ask about Smith's perspective on some unorthodox interpretations what, of what good, like messing up with other people's stuff, mean. Because it's pretty straightforward if you steal my car, for example. Yep. Uh, but if, what if I claim that you're messi messing up with my stuff if you insult me verbally? Yep. Or if you sing out of tune? Or just use <laughs> inappropriate language? or or come naked to this lecture, mm -hmm. what would be considered appropriate interpretation and, and, and what not by, by Adam Smith? Great question. Um, I think some of that gets pretty well answered, like coming naked to this thing. I mean, it, it, I mean, I consider myself in a contract here with the boss, and I consider a tacit term of the contract that I'm supposed to have clothes. So if I come up to show up without clothes, I almost feel like I'm breaking a promise due to him. Even if it hasn't been an explicit promise, a lot of our contractual terms, terms and conditions, are implicit. And we take them for granted. That's part of the social norms behind and filling in the, you know, the, 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 the nature of contracts. Okay, so I would say that you know, showing up to certain places naked is actually kind of a contract violation and is messing with you know, the, the owner, the organizer's stuff, in a way, as well as, you know, all of the people he's associating with your stuff. I mean, you believe me, you don't want to see me naked. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, you can parse it, you can bring it back to these communitive justice elements often. Some things, like speech I don't like, or that I find offensive, no, I don't think that cuts it. Unless it's incitation, the inciting of violence. Uh, I don't really think it cuts it. The question of whether reputation, when you start telling dirty lies about something, about me, that might ruin my reputation, might hurt my business, whether that's covered by um, commutative justice is, is an open issue and is debated. It's like, kind of like abortion, like how do you, which side of the line do you put something on? And, um, and I actually, I could point you to discussions about that uh, in Smith and about the sort of uh, equivocalness on Smith's part 
on that very issue. Um, but I do think the jurisprudence tradition that I pointed to actually points to not making reputation part of commutative justice. Uh, I think that's a very interesting and important issue. Um, and so you're right, it's not always precise and accurate, cut and dry. As I said, it varies in history and the community. And to some extent, we defer. What's really important is liberty. And it's like, okay, however the community sees it between neighbors, however they parse it, we want to take that parsing and apply it to government and define liberty, therefore, as the government also not messing, according to that community standards for neighbors. So you see, even if you have some variation in history, sometimes, you know, let's say my apple tree hangs over your property and you're in your property and you pick an apple off my tree, have you taken my stuff? One community might say this, one community might say that. Fine, but the point is that the whatever the rule is, the government, when it's violating, when it's doing something that would be a violation if a neighbor did it, it's a violation of liberty, which doesn't mean it shouldn't ever be done. It's not an absolute rule, liberty, but the presumption should be against it, the presumption, just like the presumption of innocence. It's not that every defendant is innocent. Some of them are guilty as hell, but the presumption is our, they, they enjoy, and the burden of proof is on the prosecution to prove that they're guilty. Thank you. I hear there are a lot more people outside actually for the yeah. party than they're here. So <laughs> sure. I, I still have some official things to go through, but we will go through them uh, downstairs. I have one thing that I cannot do downstairs, so I'll, I'll have to show it to you here. So, so this is our colleague who was supposed to be here, but he apparently is going to be awarded the uh, Volunteer of the Year tomorrow in Kyiv, and he encourages us to drink all the beer. And <laughs> we'll now move outside and continue with very brief official things, and then we can party until the morning and talk. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.